Hello world, I'm just some guy, and this is going to be the start of a series I'm going to call Historical Storytime. I've just started reading the book Infantry Attacks by General Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, a personal hero to me since middle school, and I'm going to share the story of his very first action with you. This book has an excellent introduction by his son, by the way. The first part of this is going to be everything that leads up to the actual battle, and the second part of this will be the actual battle itself. Chapter 1, Fighting at Bleed in Dulcon Woods. Part 1, The Beginning, 1914, Ulm, July 31st. The danger of war hung ominously over the German nation. Everywhere, serious, troubled faces. Unbelievable rumors which spread with the greatest of rapidity filled the air. Since dawn, all public bulletin boards had been surrounded. One extra edition of the papers followed the other. At an early hour, the 4th Battery of the 49th Field Artillery Regiment hurried through the old Imperial City. Die Wacht am Rhein resounded in the narrow streets. I rode as an infantry lieutenant and platoon commander in the Smart Fjolks Battery to which I had been assigned since March. We trotted along in the bright morning sunshine, did our normal exercises, and then returned to our quarters accompanied by an enthusiastic crowd whose numbers ran into the thousands. During the afternoon, while horses were being purchased in the barrack yard, I obtained relief from my assignment. Since the situation appeared most serious, I longed for my own regiment, the King Wilhelm I, to be back with the men whose last two years of training I had supervised in the 7th Company, 124th Infantry, 6th Württemberger. Along with Private Hanley, I hurriedly packed my belongings, and late in the evening we reached Weingarten, our garrison city. On August 1st, 1914, there was much activity in the regimental barracks and the big old cloister building in Weingarten. Field equipment was being tried on. I reported back to headquarters and greeted the men of the 7th Company, whom I was to accompany into the field. All the young faces radiated joy, animation, and anticipation. Is there anything finer than marching against an enemy at the head of such soldiers? At 1800, regimental inspection. Colonel Haas followed his thorough inspection of the field gray clad regiment with a vigorous talk. Just as we fell out, the mobilization order came. Now the decision had been made. The shout of German youths eager for battle rang throughout the ancient gray cloistered buildings. The 2nd of August, a portentous Sabbath. Regimental divine services were held in the bright sunlight, and in the evening the proud 6th Württemberger regiment marched out to resounding band music and entrained for Ravensburg. An unending stream of troop trains rolled westward toward the threatened frontier. The regimental, the regiment left at dusk to the accompaniment of cheers. To my great disappointment, I was obliged to remain behind for a few days in order to bring up our reserves. I feared that I was going to miss the first fight. The trip to the front on August 5th through the beautiful valleys and dells of our native land and amid the cheers of our people was indescribably beautiful. The troops sang, and at every stop were showered with fruit, chocolate, and rolls. Passing, passing through Kornwestheim, I saw my family for a few brief moments. We crossed the Rhine during the night. Searchlights crisscrossed the sky on the lookout for enemy planes or dirigibles. Our songs had died down. The soldiers slept in all positions. I rode in the locomotive, looking now into the firebox and then out into the rustling, whispering, sultry summer's night, and wondering what the next few days would bring. In the August of eve in the evening of August sixth, we arrived at Konigsmacher near Diedenhofen and were glad to be out of the cramped quarters of the troop train. We marched through Diedenhofen to Wrocksweiler. Diedenhofen was not a pretty sight with its dirty streets, houses, and taciturn people. It seemed so different from my home in Swabia. We continued the march, and at nightfall a torrential downpour set in. Soon there was not a dry stitch of clothing on our bodies, and the water-soaked packs began to weigh heavily. A fine beginning! Occasional shots were heard far in the distance. About midnight our platoon arrived in Ruxweiler without suffering any losses during the six-hour march. The company commander, First Lieutenant Bamert, awaited us. Cramped quarters on straw was our lot. Part 2. At the Frontier during the next few days, hard drilling welded our war strength company together. Besides platoon and company exercises, we were subjected to a wide variety of combat exercises which all placed great emphasis on the use of the spade. 
In addition, I spent several uneventful rainy days on guard with my platoon in the vicinity of Bollingen. Here, some of my men and I suffered stomach disturbances as a result of the greasy food and the freshly baked bread. On August 18th, we began our main advance toward the north. I rode my company commander's second mount. Singing gaily, we crossed the German Luxembourg frontier. The people were friendly and brought fruit and drink for the marching troops. We entered Bertersburg. Early on August 19th, we moved to the southwest, passed under the cannon of the French fortress at Longby, and bivouacked at Dahlem. The first battle was near. My stomach gave me a great deal of trouble, and even a chocolate and Zwieback diet brought no relief. I would not report sick, for I did not want to be looked upon as a shirker. On August 20, after a hot march, we reached miex la in Belgium. The 1st Battalion garrison, the outpost line, and the 2nd Battalion provided local security. The population was very reserved and reticent. A few enemy planes appeared and were fired on without result. Reconnaissance in the direction of Longwy and preparations for the first battle. The next day was to be a day of rest. In the early hours of the morning, several fellow officers and I reported to Colonel Haas, who ordered each of us to take a five-man reconnaissance detachment past Baransi and Gorsi in the direction of Kozny near Longwy to ascertain the enemy dispositions and strength. The distance out was eight miles. And to save time, we obtained permission to go by wagon as far as the outpost. Our Belgian dray horse ran away while we were still in miex la and the upshot was landing in a manure pile. With only a broken-down wagon to show as a result of our efforts, we continued our way on foot. Burdened with the responsibility of human life, we moved forward with a greater degree of caution than was normal in peacetime maneuvers. We left the town by means of a ditch along the side of the road. The road wound through the grain fields in the way of Baransi, which had been rep reported on the previous day as being occupied by weak enemy forces. On arriving, we found it unoccupied, and leaving the highway and passing gr through grain fields, we crossed the Franco-Belgian frontier, reached the southern edge of the Bois de Masson, and then descended towards Gorcy. The detachment under Lieutenant Kern followed us, covering our movement through Gorcy from a hilltop. On the gorcy cosne highway, we found signs that enemy infantry and cavalry were moving in the direction of Cosne. Greater caution was indicated. We moved off the road and continued our march through the heavy growth bordering the road. Maintaining careful observation of the road, we finally reached a clump of woods 500 yards west of Cosne. I studied the terrain with field glasses, but saw no French troops. On our way across the open field to Cosne, we came upon an old woman peacefully at work. She related in German that the French troops had left Cosne for Longwy an hour before, and there was no other troops remaining in Cosne. Would the old woman's story hold water? We worked our way through the grain fields and orchards and entered Cosne with fixed bayonets, fingers on triggers, and all eyes studying doorways and windows for telltale evidence of an ambush. However, the inhabitants appeared friendly and confirmed the old woman's statement. They brought us food and drink, but we were still distrustful and made them sample the food before helping ourselves. To speed reporting, I seized six bicycles by giving quartermaster receipts in return. Using our newly acquired conveyances, we pedaled a mile down the road in the direction of Longvy, on whose outer works heavy artillery was being laid. Far and wide, nothing was to be seen of enemy troops. The mission of the reconnaissance detachment had now been accomplished. At a fast clip, we passed through Gorsi on our way down to Baransi. We maintained a considerable interval between men and carried our guns ready for use under our arms. From Baransi on, I went on ahead of my men in order to report quickly. On the street of miex la I met a regimental commander and made my report. Tired and hungry, I headed for my quarters, looking forward to a few hours' rest. No such luck. In front of the quarters, my battalion was drawn up, ready to move. Hanley, efficient as usual, had already packed my belongings and saddled my horse. Before shoving off, there was not even enough time for a bite to eat. We marched to a hill three-quarters of a mile southeast of St. Leisure. The sky was overcast. From the southwest came the sound of rifle and occasional artillery fire. We knew that elements of the 1st Battalion, which were still on outpost duty near Valancourt, had made contact with the enemy during the afternoon. At nightfall, the regiment, less the 1st Battalion, went into bivouac some two miles south of St. Leisure, with our security elements about three-quarters of a mile ahead. I was getting ready for a night's sleep when a call came to me about a report to the regimental CP command post, located some 50 yards from my platoon bivouac area. 
Colonel Hawes asked whether I would make a trip through the woods to the 1st Battalion at Villancourt. My main mission was to give the 1st Battalion the regimental order to retire to Hill 312 by the shortest route possible, and I was appointed battalion guide. See Sketch 1. I'll show those later as best I can. With Sergeant Goals and two men from 7th Company, I went on my way. We traveled in the dusk by compass through the meadowland southeast of Hill 312. Off to the right, we heard our own sentry's challenges, now and then a rifle shot. Soon, we were climbing up a steep, thickly wooded slope. From time to time, we halted and listened to the noises of the night. Finally, after a hard climb and fleeing our way, we reached the crest of the line of hills west of Villancourt. To the southeast, we could see the glow from Longley Fortress, which had been set on fire as a result of the artillery bombardment. We descended through the thick brush towards Villancourt. Suddenly, from close at hand, a sentry called out, Halt! Who is there? Was he German or French? We knew that the French often challenged in German. We dropped to the ground. Give the countersign! None of us knew it. I called my name and rank, and was recognized. Some 1st Battalion outposts were located on the edge of the woods. It was not much farther to Villancourt. 500 yards south of the town, we found companies of the 1st Battalion resting on the side of the villancourt Musi la ville road in close order. I transmitted, I transmitted the regimental order to the battalion commander, Major Kaufman. Compliance was not possible, for the 1st Battalion was still attached to the Langer Brigade. I was taken to General Langer's CP on the hill one and a half miles southwest of Villancourt, to give him my message. General Langer ordered me to return to the regiment with the information that he could not spare our 1st Battalion until the remainder of his brigade came up to Villancourt. Downcast at the failure of our mission and physically exhausted, my three companies and I headed back to Hill 312. It was past midnight when I arrived at the regimental CP. I woke the regimental adjutant, Captain Volter, and reported. Colonel Haas also heard it. He was not greatly pleased and ordered me to go by a roundabout way to the 53rd Brigade at St. Ledger, either on foot or mounted, and report personally to the brigade commander, General von Moser, that General Langer would not release the 1st Battalion, 124th Infantry. Did I tell my colonel that this job was beyond my strength, that I had been on the go for 18 hours and was now exhausted? No, although a tough job lay ahead, it had to be done. I groped my way to the company commander's second mount, tightened the girth, and rode off to the north. I found General von Moser in a tent on the hill in a short distance southeast of St. Ledger. He was extremely displeased at my report and ordered me to return to Villancourt by way of the regimental CP, and informed General Langer that the 1st Battalion of the 124th Regiment had to be under regimental control by daybreak. I covered a total distance of six miles, part of it on horse and part of it on foot, delivered my message and got back to Hill 312 as dawn was breaking. All units were ready, Rations had been issued and eaten, and the kitchens had pulled out. My orderly, Hanle, helped me out with a swig from his canteen. Dense, wet fog surrounded us. At the regimental CP, orders were being issued. At the end of these, Rommel always writes his own personal observations and insights, and it's one of the best parts of this book. Observations. Facing the enemy, the reconnaissance detachment commander becomes conscious of his heavy responsibilities. Every mistake means casualties, perhaps the lives of his men. Therefore, any advance must be made with extreme caution and deliberation. Taking advantage of all cover, the detachment should keep off the roads and repeatedly examine the terrain with field glasses. The detachment should be organized in considerable depth. Before crossing open stretches of terrain, fire support must be arranged for. In entering a village, advance with part of the unit on the left, the rest on the right of the houses and with fingers on the triggers. Report observations rapidly, for delay lessens the value of any information. Train in time of peace to maintain direction at night with the aid of a luminous dial compass. Train in difficult, trackless, wooded terrain. War makes extremely heavy demands on the soldier's strength and nerves. For this reason, make heavy demands on your men in peacetime exercises. Thus ends part one, and I'm going to say the only thing here that I dare disagree with Rommel on. Don't have your finger on the trigger, have the safety off, finger off trigger till you've made the conscious decision to fire. But I see the point of what he means is, be very, very ready to shoot. So ends part one. Hello world. I'm just some guy, and this is the second part of historical story time number one.
with Infantry Attacks by General Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. Part 4, The Battle of Bleed. A note on pronunciation. I do not speak either German or French. I will do the best I can. About 0500, the 2nd Battalion started off for Hill 325, about a mile and a half northeast of Bleed. A thick fo ground fog lay on the dew-covered fields, limiting visibility to a scant 50 yards. The battalion commander, Major Botter, sent me on ahead to explore the road to Hill 325. Having been on the go for nearly 24 hours, I could scarcely stay in the saddle. The terrain on both sides of the country road over which I rode was covered with numerous hedges and fenced-in meadows. With map and compass I found Hill 325, the battalion came up and deployed on the northeast slope. Soon afterwards, our advanced security elements on the south and west slope of Hill 325 ran into the enemy in the fog. A brief exchange of shots was heard from several directions. Occasional rifle bullets whined overhead, above our heads. What a peculiar sound! An officer who had ridden a few hundred yards in the direction of the enemy was fired on from close range. Riflemen rushed forward and succeeded in bringing down a red-trousered Frenchman and took him prisoner. Now we heard German commands off to the left and toward the rear. Halt left! March! Increase distances! A skirmish line suddenly emerged from the fog. It was the right wing of the 1st Battalion. My company commander ordered me to deploy my platoon, make contact with the right of 1st Battalion, and advanced on the southeast of Bleed. I turned my horse over to Hanley, exchanged my automatic for his bayonet, and deployed my platoon. In skirmish formation, we advanced toward Bleed through potato fields and vegetable gardens over the southeast slope of Hill 325. A heavy fog hung over the fields, and visibility was limited to 50 or 80 yards. Suddenly, a volley was fired at us from close range. We hit the dirt and lay concealed among the potato vines. Later volleys passed high over our heads. I searched the terrain with my glasses, but found no enemy. Since he obviously could not be far away, I rushed toward him with the platoon, but the French got away before we had a chance to see him, leaving clearly defined tracks in the potato field. We continued on towards Bleed. In the excitement of the fight, we lost contact with the right wing of the 1st Battalion. Several additional volleys were fired at the platoon from out of the fog, but each time we charged, the enemy withdrew hastily. We then proceeded about a half mile without further trouble. Suddenly a high hedged fence appeared through the fog, and to the right rear we saw the outlines of a farm. At the same time we began to distinguish a group of tall trees to the left. The footprints of the enemy we had been following turned off to the right and went up the slope. Was Bleed in front of us? I left the platoon in the shelter of a hedge and sent out a scouting detachment to make contact with our neighbors on the left and with our own outfit. So far, the platoon had suffered no casualties. I went ahead with Sergeant Ostertag and two range estimators to investigate the farm ahead of us. Nothing could be seen or heard of the enemy. We reached the rear of the side of the building and found a narrow dirt path leading to a highway on the left. On the far right side, through the fog, we could distinguish another group of farm buildings. Without doubt, we were on the Musi laville side of Bleed. Cautiously, we approached the highway. I peered around the corner of the building. There! Scarcely twenty paces to the right, I saw fifteen or twenty Frenchmen standing in the middle of the highway, drinking coffee, chatting, their rifles lying idly in their arms. They did not see me. These troops were part of the 5th Company of the French 101st Infantry Regiment, who were to take up defensive positions on the southeast exit of Bleed. I withdrew quickly behind the building. Was I to bring up the platoon? No. Four of us would be able to handle this situation. I quickly informed my men of my intention to open fire. We quietly released the safety catches, jumped out from behind the building, and, standing erect, opened fire on the enemy nearby. Some of them were killed and wounded on the spot, but the majority took cover behind steps, garden walls, or the wood piles and returned our fire. Thus, at very close range, a very hot firefight developed. I stood taking aim alongside a pile of wood. My adversary was twenty yards ahead of me, well covered, behind the steps of a house. Only part of his head was showing. We both aimed and fired, almost at the same time, and missed. His shot just missed my ear. I had to load fast, aim calmly and quickly, and hold my aim. 
This was not easy at 20 yards with the sights set for 440 yards, especially since we had not practiced this type of fighting in peacetime. My rifle cracked. The enemy's head fell forward on the step. There was still about 10 Frenchmen ahead of us, a few of whom were completely covered. I signaled to my men to rush them. With a yell, we dashed down the village street. At this moment, Frenchmen suddenly appeared at all doors and windows and opened fire. Their superiority was too much. We withdrew as fast as we advanced and arrived without loss at the hedge, where our platoon was getting ready to come to our aid. Since this was no longer necessary, I ordered everyone back under cover. We were still being fired on through the fog from a building on the far side of the street, but the fire was high. And using my field glasses, I managed to locate the target, which was some 70 yards away, and I found that the enemy was firing from the roof as well as from the ground floor of a farmhouse. A number of rifle barrels were protruding from the roof tiles. Since it was impossible for the enemy to employ both rear and front sights in firing in this maneuver, this must have accounted for his fire going high over our heads. More on that later, I think. Should I wait until other forces came up or storm the entrance of bleed with my platoon? The latter course of action seemed proper. The strongest enemy force was in the building on the far side of the road, therefore we had to take this new building first. My attack plan was to open fire on the enemy on the ground floor and garret of the building with the second section, and go around the building to the right with the first section and take it by assault. Quickly the assault detachment picked up a few timbers which were lying close at hand. These were just the thing for battering down doors and gates. We also took a few bunches of straw along in order to smoke out any concealed men. Meanwhile, the second section had been lying along the hedge, ready to fire. The assault detachment had made its preparations under perfect cover. We were ready to start. On signal, the second section opened fire. I dashed forward to the right with the first section, over the same route I had passed over a few minutes before with the platoon, across the street. The enemy in the house opened fire with heavy rifle fire, mainly directed in the section behind the hedge. The assault detachment was now sheltering by the building, and safe from the hostile fire. The doors gave way with a crash under heavy blows of the battering ram. Burning bunches of straw were thrown onto the threshing floor, which was covered with grain and fodder. The building had been surrounded. Anyone who had taken a notion to leap out would have landed on our bayonets. Soon bright flame leapt from the roof. Those of the enemy who were still alive laid down their arms. Our casualties consisted of a few slightly wounded. We now rushed from building to building. The second section was called up. Wherever we ran into the enemy, he either surrendered or took cover in the building recesses from which he was soon routed. Other elements of the second battalion, which had mingled with those of the first battalion, now forced their way through the entire village, which was a fire in many places. The formations became intermingled. Rifle fire came from all directions, and casualties mounted. In a side street, I rushed forward to a church, surrounded by a wall from which heavy rifle fire was being directed at us. Making use of available cover and rushing from house to house, we approached the enemy. As we advanced to the assault, he gave way, retreated westward, and was soon lost in the fog. We now received very heavy fire on our left flank from the south part of Bleed, and our casualties began to increase. On every side, we heard the piteous cries for medical help. An aid station was established behind the laundry. Most of the wounds were severe. Some of the men cried with pain. Others looked death in the eye with the composure of heroes. In the northwest and south portions of Bleed, the French were still in possession. Behind us, the town was ablaze. In the meantime, the sun had dissipated the fog. Nothing more could now be done in Bleed, so I assembled everyone within reach, arranged stretcher parties for the wounded, and moved off towards the northeast. I wanted to get out of this cauldron and re-establish contact with my own outfit. Fire, dense, stifling smoke, glowing timbers, crumbling houses, and frightened cattle running wildly among the burning buildings barred our way. Finally, half suffocated, we reached the open. First we took care of the many wounded. Then I assembled the formation of about 100 men and headed on to the shallow depression 300 yards northeast of Bleed. There I left the platoon, deployed to the west, and went with the section leaders on reconnaissance to the next rise in the terrain. See Sketch 2. To the right and above us lay Hill 325, still covered with fog. In the tall fields of grain on its southern slope, 
We could not recognize friend or foe. Off to the right, and about a half mile ahead of us on the far side of a draw, we saw the red breeches of French infantry and company strength on the front edge of a yellow wheat cornfield, of a yellow wheat field behind fresh earthworks. They belonged to the 7th Company of the French 101st Infantry Regiment. In the low area to the left and below us, the fight for burning bleed still raged. Where were our company in the 2nd Battalion? Were some still in bleed with their bulk further to the rear? What was I to do? Since I did not wish to remain idle with my platoon, I decided to attack the enemy opposite us in the sector of the 2nd Battalion. Our deployment behind the ridge, our movement into position, and the opening of fire by the platoon carried out with the composure and precision of a peacetime maneuver. Soon the groups were in echelon, part of them in the potato field, part of them well concealed behind the bundles of oats, from whence they delivered a slow and well-aimed fire as they had been taught to do in peacetime training. As soon as the leading squads went into position, the enemy opened with heavy rifle fire, but his fire was still too high. Only a few bullets struck in front of us and beside us, and we soon became accustomed to this. The only result of fifteen minutes' fire was a hole in a mess kit. Half a mile to our rear, we saw our skirmish line advancing over Hill 325. This assured support for our right, and the platoon was now free to attack. We rushed forward by groups, each being mutually supported by the others, a maneuver we had practiced frequently during peacetime. We crossed a depression which was defilated from the enemy's fire. Soon I had nearly the whole platoon together in the dead angle on the opposite slope. Thanks to poor enemy marksmanship, we had suffered no casualties up to this time. With fixed bayonets, we worked our way up the rise and to within storming distance of the hostile position. During this movement, the enemy's fire did not trouble us, for it passed high over us towards those portions of the platoon that were still a considerable distance behind us. Suddenly, the enemy's fire ceased entirely. Wondering if he was preparing to rush us, we assaulted his position, but, except for a few dead, found it deserted. The tracks of the enemy led off to the west through the field in which the grain was as tall as a man. Again, I found myself well in advance and of my own line with my platoon. I decided to wait until our neighbors on the right came up. The platoon occupied the position they had just gained. Then, together with the company of the first section, a first sergeant of the sixth company, and Sergeant Bentel, I moved off on reconnaissance to the west to learn where the enemy had gone. The platoon maintained contact. Some four hundred yards north of Bleed, we reached the road connecting Givamont and Bleed without having encountered the enemy. The road became higher as it went to the north, passing through a cut at this point. On both sides of the road, large clumps of bushes interfered with the view of the northwest and west. We used one of these clumps of bushes as an OP. Strange to say, nothing was to be seen of the retreating enemy. Suddenly, Bentel pointed with his arm to the right, north. Scarcely a hundred and fifty yards away, the grain was moving and through it we saw the sun's reflections on bright cooking gear piled on top of tall French packs. The enemy was withdrawing from the fire of our guns which were sweeping the highest portion of the ridge to the west of Hill 325. I estimated that about a hundred Frenchmen were coming straight at us in columnette files. Not one of them lifted his head above the grain. These soldiers belonged to the 6th Company of the 101st Infantry Regiment. They had been attacked on the west slope of Hill 325 by elements of the 123rd Grenadier Regiment and were now retreating towards the southwest. Was I to call up the remainder of the platoon? No. They could give us better support from their present position. The penetration effect of our rifle ammunition came to mind. He's talking about full metal jacket and like a hunting or sniper rifle caliber, 7mm Mauser, 30-06, 303 Enfield, etc. 7.62 by 51R. Two or three men at this distance. I fired quickly at the head of the column from a standing position. The column dispersed into the field, then, after a few moments, it contained the march. It continued the march in the same direction and in the same formation. Not a single Frenchman raised his head to locate this new enemy who had appeared so suddenly and so close to him. Now the three of us fired at the same time. Again, the column disappeared for a short time, then split into several parts, and hastily dispersed in a westerly direction towards the Givamont Bleed Highway. We opened with rapid fire on the fleeing enemy. Strange to say, we had not been fired on, even though we were standing upright and were plainly visible to the enemy. To the left, on the far side of the clump of bushes where we were standing, Frenchmen came running down the highway. They were easily shot down as we fired at them through a break in the bushes at a range of about ten yards. 
We divided our fire, and dozens of Frenchmen were put out of action by the fire of our three rifles. The 123rd Grenadier Regiment was advancing up the slope to the right. I signaled my platoon to follow, and then we advanced northwards on both sides of the Givamont Bleed Road. During our advance, we encountered a number of Frenchmen in the bushes along the road. It took a lot of talking to get them out of their hiding places and make them lay down their arms. They had been taught that the Germans would behead all their prisoners. We got more than 50 men out of the bushes and grain fields, including two French officers, a captain, and a lieutenant who had been slightly wounded in the arm. My men offered the prisoners cigarettes, which increased their confidence. To the right on the hill, the 123rd Grenadier Regiment also reached the Givamont Bleed Road. We were being fired on from the direction of the forest-covered peak, La Matte, which was 5,000 feet high and lay northwest of Bleed. As quickly as possible, I got the platoon into the cut on the right so they would be under cover, with the intention of resuming the fight with an attack on La Matte from this point. Suddenly, however, everything went black before my eyes, and I passed out. The exertions of the previous day and night, the battle for bleed in the hill to the north, and last but not least, the terrible condition of my stomach had sapped the last ounce of my strength. I must have been unconscious for some time. When I came to, Sergeant Bentel was working over me. French shell and shrapnel were striking intermittently in the vicinity. Our own infantry was retiring towards Hill 325 in the direction of the Lamatte Woods. What was it? A retreat? I commandeered part of a line of riflemen occupied the slope among the Gevamont Bleed Road, and ordered them to, to dig in. From the men, I learned that they had sustained heavy casualties in the Matt Woods, had lost their commander, and that their withdrawal was executed on orders from a superior commander. Above all, French artillery wrought great havoc among them. A quarter of an hour later, buglers sounded regimental call and assembly. From all sides, parts of the regiment worked their way towards the area west of Bleed. One after the other, the different companies came in. There were many gaps in their ranks. In its first fight, the regiment had lost 25% of its officers and 15% of its men dead, wounded, and missing. I was deeply grieved to learn that two of my best friends had been killed. As soon as its formations had been recorded, the battalion set off toward Gomery, through the south part of Bleed. Bleed presented a terrible sight. Among the smoking ruins lay dead soldiers, civilians, and animals. The troops were told that the opponents of the German 5th Army had been defeated all along the line and were in retreat. Yet, in achieving our first victory, our success was considerably tempered by grief over the loss of our comrades. We marched south, but our progress was frequently halted, for in the distance we saw enemy columns on the march. Batteries of the 49th Artillery Regiment trotted ahead and went into position on the right of the highway. By the time we heard their first shots, the enemy columns had disappeared into the distance. Night fell. Nearly dead from fatigue, we finally reached the village of Rouet, which was already more than filled with our own troops. We bivouacked in the open. No straw could be found, and our men were much too tired to search for it. The damp, cold ground kept us from getting a refreshing sleep. Toward morning it grew chilly. All of us were pitifully cold. During the morning hours, my complaining stomach made me restless. Finally, day dawned. Again, thick fog lay over the fields. Hello, world. I'm just some guy. And this is the third installment and the conclusion for Historical Storytime, Part 1, Infantry Attacks, General Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. Observations. It is difficult to maintain contact in fog. During the battle, in the fog at bleed, contact was lost soon after meeting the enemy, and it was not possible to re-establish it. Advances through fog by means of a compass must be practiced, since smoke will frequently be employed. In a meeting engagement in the fog, the side capable of developing a maximum firepower on contact will get the upper hand. Therefore, keep the machine guns ready for action, at all times during an advance. Fights in inhabited places often take place at extremely short ranges, a few yards. Hand grenades and machine pistols are essential. By machine pistols, he means SMGs. It would also include today probably things like shotguns, short-barreled rifles, things for that kind of fighting. Provide fire protection before attacking by means of machine guns, mortars, and assault guns. 
An attack in a village is usually accompanied by heavy casualties and should be avoided whenever possible. Pin the enemy down to the village by means of fire, or blind him with smoke and hit him outside the village or town. Tall grain offers good concealment, but shining articles such as bayonets and cooking utensils may betray the location of troops. French security measures at Bleed were totally inadequate. Likewise, they failed to observe proper security precautions during this retreat and during the combat in the fields. After the first exchange, the German rifleman became imbued with a feeling of superiority vis-a-vis -vis his French counterpart. Thus concludes General Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's first engagement during the First World War at the very start of it in 1914 when he was still just a lieutenant and his observations on the action. So as always, I'm no expert, just some guy. Peace. And as I promised, here are some of the illustrations. And with that, I'd like to say that soon I will be able to say the same as General Patton in the movie. Rommel, you magnificent bastard, I read your book!